Okay, so we're going to work through now a series of problems involving the conservation of angular momentum. Okay, so um, here we have a this turnstile. Okay, so it's we kind of mentioned one in class the other day. Something you know, like you go to a theme park and you walk past the thing, uh, and it like counts you. And then this would be like a one that's or oriented horizontally and it rotates like this. And so like as you walk through it, it rotates and maybe counts you or something, or maybe it's preventing someone from walking the opposite direction through it. <clears throat> so anyway, we have this turnstile and this blob of mud is going to hit it, okay, from this angle, okay? And we want to find the angular velocity of the system after this collision happens, okay? So this is, we have a collision happening, okay, we have it rotation that's a clue that we should use conservation of angular momentum so we would want to calculate the angular momentum before so in order to do so we're going to add the angular momentum of the turnstile plus the angular momentum of the blob and that would be equal to the angular momentum of the turnstile plus the angular momentum of the blob afterwards okay so before the angular momentum of the turnstile is going to be we would need to multiply I times omega. And the reason we're using I omega is because it's a object rotating about a fixed axis. Okay, it's a rigid object. It has dimensions. So we can't treat it like a point. So we use I omega. Um, for the ball, we're going to use R cross P because we can treat that one like a particle, which means M times R cross V or M times r times whatever that perpendicular velocity is. Okay, so if we're looking at this ball, it has a component velocity this way and a component this way. Okay, to find this one right here, we could use cosine of 60 times that velocity. Since we know this angle, it would give us this side. We could also use this angle and it would be sine of 30. So, <clears throat> what that means for us is this. The angular velocity for that blob will be the mass of the ball, which is equal to m over 3, times the radius. So it's going to pass within, it's going to hit right here, this distance, d. Since we're finding the perpendicular velocity, we can use this distance. If we wanted to use the perpendicular radius, we might trace it and see where it hits there. And this is the easier approach on this one. So we're going to use distance d of 0.5 meters. Okay, let's just put d in right now. Okay, so distance d times the velocity times that cosine of 60. Okay, and then for the moment of inertia of the turnstile, we basically have four rods connected, or we could treat them as two like longer ones. So they would have a length L, or a length of 2D, for one of them. And there's two of them. Well, for one, it would be 1 12th ML squared. If we say that this is one long rod, then we, can, we don't have to use parallel axis there. OK, so that's 1 12th um, mass M. I guess it, since it's two of them, it would be mass of 2M. So we'd say 2m, and then l was 2d, and so we're going to square that. And then that's times omega, or that initial omega. So we have 1 12th times 2m times 2d squared plus m over 3 times d times v cosine 60. Okay? Now, let's talk about the other side of the equation. This represents afterwards, after they collide, okay, in which they're sticking together and they're rotating together, which means they have the same angular velocity. So in this case, it would just be the combined moment of inertia of the two objects times omega. And we'll come back to this in just a second. Let's simplify this first, okay? And we'll leave m in terms of m, but we'll put in 0.5 for d. Okay. 
Oh, and I forgot the omega right here. That was negative two. Okay, so then we have right here the velocity of 12 meters per second. I'm just gonna simplify all this stuff right now. Okay, so I've done some simplifying. I got the moment of inertia for the turnstile would just be 1 sixth m. We're gonna multiply by the velocity of negative two radians per second. And that's gonna give us negative one third m. And then for the blob, I have a moment of inertia of, or angular momentum of one m. Okay, so on the other side, when they stick together, they're going to have the same angular velocity. For the turnstile, it will be the same. It will be this mess right here, which simplified to be 1 sixth kilogram meter squared. And then for the, rock, or for the blob of mud, now that it's rotating about that axis, we'll treat it like a fixed point on that axis. And so we're going to use mr squared for i. Okay. Um, and so we're using this instead of r cross p because now it's fixed and it has that same angular velocity as the other one. Okay, so that would be 1 sixth plus m over 3 times 0.5 meters squared times omega. Okay, so anyway on this side we finish simplifying and we get um, 2 thirds m and this one is 1 sixth m rather. Okay. And then this right here will simplify. <clears throat> to I think 0.25 m times omega. All right. So we're going to divide over the 0.25 and the m and get that the angular velocity after the collision is 2.67 radians per second. Okay, so it went from rotating this way, 2 radians per second, to after the collision rotating this way at a speed of 2.67. Alright, now this seems like a pretty extreme change and the reason why it was so extreme is that the mass of the rod and the mass of the ball were so similar. Okay, the ball or the chunk of mud or whatever would not be even within a third of the mass of the rod, so that's probably what happened there. Um, also, I made a mistake it looks like because since there's two of them, we'd want to multiply this by two. Okay, which means that this should be negative two thirds, which means that this would be one third. Okay, which means that our answer is twice as big as it should be. So this should be 1.33 radians per second. So here's another situation. We have a boy sitting on a rotating chair holding a wheel that's spinning. Okay, and we want to know what the angular velocity of the boy is after inverting the wheel. Okay, so initially the boy has zero angular velocity. Um... Uh, but we're given his rotational inertia, the rotational inertia of the wheel, and the moment of inertia of the wheel. Or sorry, the moment of inertia of the wheel and the angular velocity of the wheel. Okay, so just like before, we're going to use I omega for each piece. Okay, since they're fixed, rotating at a fixed axis. Okay, they're objects with dimensions. And to make things easier for us, we're given all of these values. Okay, so initially... Let's say that this is for the boy, that's going to be equal to zero. And this is what we want to find afterwards. Okay, the moment of inertia of the wheel is 1.2. The initial velocity <clears throat> of the wheel is 3.9 revolutions per second. Okay, the moment of inertia of the boy is 6.8 kilogram meters squared. Okay, and then here again we have for the wheel. The moment of inertia of the wheel is 1.2 kilogram meters squared, and the angular velocity would now be negative 3.9 radians per second because he's inverted the wheel, causing it to spin in the opposite direction. Okay, and what this is going to do, it's going to the him turning the wheel over. He exerted a torque on the wheel because he changed its angular momentum from positive to negative. Okay, and so in doing so, he had to exert a torque on it because he changed the rotation. 
in the process of changing that rotation, uh, Newton's third law says for every force, there's an equal force in the opposite direction. And so the wheel also exerted a torque on the boy, causing him to rotate. Now, to me, this is just crazy because this object floating in the air that's rotating actually exerts a torque on this boy, causing him to rotate. It's just crazy. Okay, so let's go ahead and do the calculation. All right, 1.2 times 3.9. This is going to give us this kilogram meter squared times revolutions per second. And we're going to get angular velocity at rates per second. <coughs> um, so 1.2 times 3.9, 4.68 kilogram meter squared times revs per second equals 6.8 times the velocity of the boy plus this would just be negative 4.68 kilogram meter squared times revs per second. Okay? <clears throat> now the reason I'm leaving it in revs per second, all that's going to do for us is give us this velocity in revs per second. Save us a little bit of work. Okay? So we add this over, we're going to get 9.36 kilogram meters squared times revolutions per second equals 6.8 times the end of the velocity of the boy. We divide 6.8 over, okay, and this would just be kilogram meters squared, um, and we get that the boy's angular velocity is equal to 1.4 revolutions per second. So what that means is, he was stationary, sitting on this frictionless chair. He turned it over, flipped the wheel over, inverted it, and it caused him to spin at that speed. Okay, so that is the power of angular momentum.